Thank you, Deanna. That was lovely. Um, and thanks to the tree in general, uh, to Margaret and Carol and Deanna uh, for all their work. Uh, and thanks to you all for being here. And uh, I didn't actually drive two hours to get here. Stephanie did, so thanks to Stephanie, too. Um, so, uh, as well as possibly being a philosopher's poet, I've been putting some energy into actually being a philosopher the last while. So I've been working on a PhD dissertation on beauty, which means that I've also been writing poems about beauty. So I'm going to read some of those to you. Um, uh, this first one, um, so while I was reading dry academic essays about beauty, uh, there was a little footnote in one of them that referred uh, to the unit of measurement uh, for beauty. There is actually one according to the International Bureau of Weights and Measures. Uh, the be beauty is measured in the millihelen, uh, where one millihelen equals the amount of beauty it takes to launch exactly one ship. <laughs> it was a great find. So this is a poem called Ends of the Earth. How many ships are launching today in this late September sun? How quickly do they run aground? And are they more beautiful as ruin, spilling gold over the road, which floods and thus lifts them up again, resurrected? This may have been what Ashbury meant by the double dream of spring. Only we're in autumn now, almost mostly. And that way of talking, autumn, spring, may be too simple for what's going on. We launch ships upon ships, failed attempts to reach the ends of the earth, the final amen. The dream doubled and redoubled in an even now I hope, which I do, even now. Quixotic ship of fools setting out for visions, full sail, here in the complications, under the late millihellenial sun. Um, and, and when we were on the way here, Stephanie was telling me that uh, her daughter, who is seven, <laughs> uh, is about to go from taking one ballet class a week to three ballet classes a week and being in the Nutcracker. And when we uh, got to her house, she was just coming out on her way to dance class with the hair and her little bun and the whole bit. So I have two poems here that I was going to read anyway uh, that, uh, that deal with the ballet. So those are going out to Madeline now. Um, this first one came from reading about the history of ballet. Uh, I was stunned to find out that the first ballet dancers were actually men uh, because it's such a woman's dance now. Um, and in fact, the man who's identified as the first ballet dancer was Louis XIV of France. <laughs> so this is called First Corps de Ballet. There was a man mistook himself for the sun, for fire. He trained assiduously. He danced because that's what fire does, especially in the pit of the eye. To command the I is to command the man. He was no fool. King since the age of four, he entertained no comparison of the arch of his foot, but to the firmament. It was discussed alongside the tenderness of quail and other delicate matters. Apollo was his role of choice. His ballet master replaced him sometimes so he could witness his own glory. And that last part is actually true. He would get his ballet master to dance his part so that he could see how fabulous he was. Um, so this next one, there's ballet in it, but it's not really focused on ballet. Uh, but Nijinsky makes an appearance, uh, twice in fact. Uh, Nijinsky was uh, famous early in the last century uh, as a dancer who could just jump astonishingly. So this poem is called Leap. Spring again, 
the magnolia is in bloom again. And because there is no end of praise, photographers crowd the park. The same shots blooming on flicker every year, flocks of them, renewing themselves like the May, a vow. The gesture is exact, for even done to death, the flowers persist, inexhaustible, exhibiting a Nijinsky-like power to leap through time, reappearing on the far side of winter while rehearsed, taking the light in hand yet again, and taming it to the degree that a wild thing can be tamed, barely. We want to give birth in beauty, said Plato. When that beauty is a magnolia tree, the birth may be boundless. When Nijinsky leapt, they said, it seemed he'd never land. So when I started writing poems about beauty, I had this idea where I was going to do a series of poems called Exercises in Beauty. And each one would take a different uh, sort of theory about beauty or approach to beauty that I'd been reading about and kind of address it in a poem. And uh, it turned out to be a really bad idea. <laughs> Most of the poems didn't work well at all. Um, but I have two, two left at the end of the day. And so this is Exercise in Beauty number one. Oh, and I should mention, there's the word Virga in here, which is, I think, an odd enough word that I should tell you if you don't know, but uh, Virga is the name of a rain that evaporates before it hits the ground. A skeletal lace, cross-section of river foam, the spent leaf hangs from its stalk, worn down to the seams cobweb shadow, two summers old, on the brink of disappearing, a Virga. What does it mean, this leaf? What does it say? That there's life in death? In, not after. Imagine such a life, its bareness as the wind blows through the lattice without a physic, at the mercy of, yes, unresolved even now. So stay your hand a moment. Let the mineral in your blood settle. Could you be swept up? Like dust, I mean, like dust. Like the leaf dangling from its branch undone, unto. The frailest thread possible, hang from it. Oh. Oops. So here's one more on the beauty theme. Um, this one was actually uh, published first in ARC um, in a slightly different version, so thanks to ARC for that. Uh, these are slotted. Uh, and it's uh, about oil painting. Um, there's an epigraph to this, which I won't read, that uh, explains the, the idea that uh, when oil painting was first developed, uh, it was used in religious contexts uh, to be sort of the embodiment of the glory and grace of God and Christ. Uh, and then, uh, but it was very quickly taken over by rich merchants <laughs> who wanted to use it uh, to, to um, commission paintings that would display their wealth with the same kind of glow and presence. Uh, so there was sort of a, a stealing from the church uh, so the title of the poem is Heaven's Thieves. The codfish, a drizzled oily silver, dozes beside crusts of white bread. A cluster of grapes drapes over the foot of the goblet. 
each one blooming in its own pale bubble. Bored, like every other painted thing. As though the game has been played, as though I could pluck the knife from the carved frame, and the fish, the fruit, would go on floating in their paint slick, too well fed to have an eye for consequence, yet strangely dissatisfied, fatty, iridescent, clinging to half-lives, even as they divide and diminish down to almost nothing, a nothing that radiates like the thought of gold in the minds of its inheritors. The light is Promethean. Let it pour over you. Let it shine in the eyes of whoever looks your way. Let even the damage gleam and be satisfied, which is what the fish and wine and fruit are doing. Look, simmering in the stubborn sun, paraded on the table like subdued peacocks, plates dressed in the spoils of a ransacked heaven. Betrayal is in the air, but impossible to steal from rich for poor without a little of this. And there are beauties willing to do the job. I mean the beauty that's willing to sleep its way out of a tough situation, willing to not quite die for its cause. Even the grapes, even the half-peeled lemon, lying there brazenly, clothed in stolen bounty, flaunting their ill-begotten skins. Uh, okay, so shifting away from beauty, um, in some ways randomly toward this poem, which is just one that I like. <laughs> um, there's a bit more of a story in this one, and uh, there's a reference to um, the uh, famous painting on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel with uh, uh, God and Adam uh, sort of reaching out to one another, almost touching fingers. It's called Fear of Wasps. He tried to explain it to me, how his friend fell off his bike and broke his clavicle after a wasp flew up his shirt and stung him repeatedly, continuing to sting him even after he'd fallen into the ditch and lay in the dirt howling while my friend laughed at him, doubled over, unable to clasp his friend's outstretched hand. The story told me almost nothing about wasps. But his failure to grasp his friend's hand puts me in mind of Adam's finger, almost but not quite touching God's. And perhaps the wasps are somehow the embodiment of the space between those two hands, that inch of not being. They are the gap my friend fears in the world, flying zeros buzzing nihilists. Their carrion loving bodies, a lacuna carried from one day into the next. It's not a fear of being stung, but of being stung and reaching out and finding nothing there. For he loved his friend, but despised him in equal measure. And the gap between these things he cannot account for. So I'm going to switch back and read a couple of poems from Breaker. Oh my God. And something that was interesting to me when I started doing all this academic work about beauty and uh, then writing poems about beauty was looking back at older poems and realizing how much beauty had already been there before I really started uh, concentrating on it. So it actually pops up in this poem. Um, 
This poem I, th I think of as uh, uh, kind of uh, laughingly to myself as an anti-nature poem um, because uh, I grew up poetically, I guess, uh, around nature poets. I had nature poets as mentors. Uh, so I sort of like the idea of having a very, very small scale rebellion. <clears throat> uh, this is called Big East Lake. This is the world, impenetrable. The flat black pupil that doesn't look at you. You want to be wooed, to praise it. Instead, you're bored. Beauty, what of it? You feel yourself at the bottom of a well. Love of the landscape can't be roused. Nature has shifted into your blind spot. No longer a vision. No longer your ego revealed to itself. The trees, immersed in growth, occupied by their own being. The water slips off your paddle. The shore slips into the water's darkness. You shift uncomfortably in the bow, haven't the heart for this. The light travels a little slower here, the trees quieter, sober. If it weren't too late, you'd go back on whatever promise brought you here. I'm thinking two more. Um, this one, I guess you could call a pro-nature poem. Um, I started writing it when I was in Saskatchewan one year, which is not a place I've spent a lot of time, but they were going through a drought, and uh, it was quite striking to me, coming from Newfoundland, where drought is not really an issue. <clears throat> it's called drought. And overhead, the birds, chips of bone in the sky, remnants, fact of the world's brokenness. You look up, asking to be forgiven for a crime you're still trying to locate. You know it's out there, stare toward the edge of the marsh, the welt of bright water shrinking before your eyes. A sky of pre-worldly clarity only confirms your guilt. An inherent misalignment that keeps you from knowing even a fraction of what you see. You cross the heat-ridden ground. The sweet, brittle scent of sage rides, rising underfoot. So easy to pretend a single word will occur to you and that it will do all the good anyone could hope. The earth is parched and lonely, relies on dignity to protect it. Each thing hanging by the thread of itself. Bleeding crickets, rustle of dry stalks. The silence pushes you toward yourself. It's time to walk deep into the heart of what troubles you. Um, and the last poem I have here is really about walking uh, out of the heart of what troubles you. Um, it's also, I want to over explain, but <laughs> uh, Nick was actually just talking about uh, the experience of being in New York City for the first time and uh, uh, not even really doing much but being out and about and finding just the sheer demand to perceive <laughs> being utterly exhausting. So that's that kind of experience is in here too. It's called Asleep. A wasp-like hum in the room. The something going on that passes for silence in these quarters. 
for we want to believe in silence, that our repose leaves nothing behind, empties all the chambers, takes the present into our dreams with us, and leaves a void that works like acid on all that was. Car headlights on the wall mean nothing. The cramped, ungrowing furniture, nothing. The church spires, tired bells, nothing. They are but the residue of day, less than echoes. The last creaking stair on the way out of perception. We have come to an agreement, tired of the world in its inalienable unlikeness. We'll give up coaxing it out. So the night darkens, the curtain drifts out the window, the very lateness of the hour ceases. We sleep side by side with eternity and never touch. Thanks again. Thanks for listening so well.